Well, this week is the last in the current series of the, I think, 50 Days of God Conversations. To trust you found it helpful thus far. Dan said earlier on he hoped that that was what I was going to speak about. Well, actually, I am, but I want to... Uh, mention something and I think it's quite important in our relationship with God and in our conversations. It doesn't really have, seem to have come out in the, um, in the studies we've done. So you've actually got a two-part sermon this morning. Isn't that exciting? But funny enough, both parts are covered by the same Bible reading. So we'll have a look at the Bible reading first, which is uh, Revelation 5, chapters... Yeah, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within, and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and to look at it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people, a nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, myriad, myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. I'm going to go on and read the next couple of verses as well because it doesn't seem quite finished there properly, does it? Saying with a loud voice, Who is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing? And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is within them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Peter Bowler, a friend of Charles Wesley, said, If I had a thousand tongues to sing, I would praise Christ with them all. Bowler was quoting from a German hymn written by John Metzner titled, and my German's not very good, so uh, if yours is, bear with me. O das ich tausend zungen hat, which translated means, oh that I had a thousand voices. Metzner was inspired by the words in the book of Revelation, which we just read. I heard the voices of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands. 
God certainly deserves our praise. He is our creator and we are the works of his hands. Our God who created the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, even the galaxies that we know nothing about. He deserves our praise. The God that created the hills, the mountains, the valleys, the earth, the seas, and all that swim the paths of the seas, Psalm 8, deserves our praise. Someone has said that even all the hairs on, if all the hairs on our heads were tongues, that wouldn't be enough to praise God. And that's so true, especially since the average person has between 100,000 and 150,000 hairs on their head. Sadly, some of us have plenty, some of us don't have so much. But, um, and some of, someone has said that a million tongues wouldn't be enough to praise God. And why should we praise God? Well, because we were created for praise. Did you know praise is actually good for you? I think some studies have suggested that those that spend time praising God actually live longer than those that don't. Praise is good for you. And what a great way to commune with our Creator, with our Redeemer, than in praise. I would even suggest that we're more open to hearing from God when we're engaged in praise. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. Psalm 22, verse 3, Yet you are holy, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. When we read about visions of heaven in the Bible, we're always presented God being constantly worshipped by legions and legions of angels. Look back at Isaiah chapter 6. It was the year that King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two... They flew. And they were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations and the entire building was filled with smoke. And in Revelation 2, which we've just read, so I won't read through it all again, where it talks about the voices of many angels, thousands and thousands, worshipping the Lamb who was slain. And if the angels and all of creation worship him day and night, then we, who are also part of his creation on earth, should do the same. We should be able to praise God any time that we have chance to, and opportunity to do so. I think it's expected that Christians worship God when they go to church on Sundays, part of the service. Although some people seem to think that missing praise and worship on Sundays is okay because it's not essential. Some even say that they will go to church when the praise and worship's finished. As far as I know, no one here does that. But I trust there isn't. Because that shouldn't be so. The important part of any church service, I would suggest to you, is the praise and worship. Because that's the only thing that God gets out of the service. Once it's done, we move on to prayers about us, the sermon, which is to help us. God will not eat our food if we prepare a banquet for him. 
He does not want our fine houses or fancy cars. The only thing he wants from us is the fruit of our lips. The praise that he so richly deserves. Interestingly, when we praise God, our praises release more blessings. That's how good God is. When praises go up, blessings come down. And some people even consider worship to be more important than prayer. Once you lift up your hands and worship, you get the attention of heaven as you join those legions of angels to worship God. Some people want to wait till God blesses them before they thank him and bless him. Well, actually, praise is not about what we get from God. It's about who God is. And you know what? God never changes. So we can always praise our God. Because it doesn't depend on what we receive. It doesn't depend on our circumstances. It only depends on who he is. And he doesn't change. Don't wait till Sunday to praise God. You can do it any time, day or night. That way, you will draw closer to God and he will draw closer to you. The actual title on the sermon series for today is John's God conversation about living in a hostile world. Didn't go quite the way I expected it to. The notes that we were provided. But certainly important to understand what God's saying to us through this closing part of a series. Acts 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when you, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. As we draw closer to God, the Holy Spirit speaks to us and leads us in ways that are so different from the human kingdom. In God's kingdom, followers of Jesus are called to follow the way of the Lamb, which we'll talk about a bit more in a few minutes. And as we do, evil will be overcome. We've already read uh, the reading from Revelation 5. You can leave it up on the screen, actually, uh, Moran, thank you. Phil has on part of the uh, post office uh, inquiry. We leave it on the screen. We'll read this bit. Scary stuff. But what does it mean to follow Jesus in a hostile world where not everyone, as I'm sure we well know, follows God's ways? And evil seems to reign. Well, imagine being back with the early church. Back in the first century, Christianity was only a minority movement. Living under the shadow of the great Roman Empire. In this world, everyone was expected to worship both the Greek Roman gods and the Roman emperor. Rituals such as burning incense to the gods at festivals, making sacrifices at the temple, and paying homage to the emperors, king of kings and lord of lords, were an integral part of civic duty. Pressure to conform was everywhere. Even in those early days of the church, some had already been persecuted for refusing to comply. 
So how was a follower of Jesus to respond? God's answer came to John in the form of a series of powerful dream visions. I must admit, I wouldn't normally speak on Revelation. It's not a book I find easy to preach on, but it's part of the thing, isn't it? So we have to. But there's certainly, certainly some interesting imagery there. And John wrote his visions down and sent them to the seven churches across Asia. And today we can read them in the book of Revelation. And today we learn from one of the most important visions of John's, John's God conversations. So the Holy Spirit frequently talks in picture form, also known as visions, dreams. Dreams usually refers to pictures while we sleep and visions to pictures while we're awake. But in biblical history, the words were interchangeable. Dream visions are the most common form of speech, God's speech, in Scripture. And the book of Revelation is actually full of them. And Joel said, didn't he, after this, I will pour out my spirit on all men. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams and your young men will see visions. One of those, the most important of those visions centers on the throne room in heaven. It's full of fascinating imagery. We see an example of how dream visions use the language of symbolism to paint that picture. It's a powerful and effective language. They say, don't they, a picture paints or speaks a thousand words. But it does require careful interpretation and understanding of the context in which it's given. If that's what God wants to do, if that's the way God wants to speak to us, then we should expect to hear from him in that way. In interpreting dream visions, we need to think about the meaning of the symbols of the people who receive them. In John's vision, we need to consider what the symbols meant to him, what those symbols meant to the churches in Asia Minor. We need to know the context. So let's have a look at the key symbols of that throne room scene. First century people would have been familiar with the throne of Rome, where the emperor, likely Domitian at the time, Domitian was known to have 24 senior officials in his court who ruled the various provinces of the empire. And they would present their crowns before him to gain his favor. But John's vision presents the throne of another kingdom, in contrast, with someone else sitting on the throne. In his vision, the 24 elders were likely represented the leaders of God's kingdom, the 12 tribes of Israel under the old covenant, and the 12 apostles of Jesus under the new. So we have two throne rooms, two kingdoms, two rulers. And then we see the four winged creatures who circle the throne. One with the face of a lion, one an ox, the third a man, and the fourth an eagle. You can read this in Revelation chapter 4 if you want to look it up, verses 6 and 7. This may sound strange to us, but these depictions of heavenly creatures were common in the ancient world. They're a kind of hybrid creature between animals and humans and represent the diversity of creation. All creation is involved in God's kingdom. 
God's kingdom rule. The scroll, in John's vision, the scroll is in the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. And it should be no surprise that statues of Roman emperors usually seen with a scroll in his right hand. For the first century audience, the scroll likely represents the ruler's authority and power to lead the kingdom. The question was in Revelation 5, who is worthy to open it? The Lion of Judah. This was a famous Jewish symbol associated with the promised Messiah and was associated with power and victory. But then we get this almost shocking appearance of the Lamb. In contrast, seemingly, to the strength and might of the Lion, Jesus comes as a blood-stained Lamb who gave his life for the world in sacrificial love. That passage also talks that the lamb, about the lamb having seven horns, seven eyes. And although the blood-stained lamb may appear weak, he has perfect sight. Seven being the ancient symbol of perfection. And perfect strength, his horns being the ancient symbol of strength. So in actual fact, the blood-stained lamb, the one who appears weak, is actually very strong. So an understanding of the symbols of the first century context help us to understand the meaning of John's vision. And perhaps you can begin now to see how two kingdoms, two rulers, and two very different ways of ruling When we hear the Holy Spirit, oops, when we hear the Holy Spirit speak, we will know that He will always sound like Jesus, because it was Jesus who sent His Spirit to continue His ministry on earth. And the Spirit will remind us of the things that and the truths that Jesus taught, and apply them to the context of our lives. He won't tell us to do anything that Jesus himself wouldn't do. In John's, John's, in John's God conversation, Holy Spirit was speaking to the churches in Asia about the differences between those two kingdoms. The human kingdom had an emperor on the throne. His way of ruling was with violence and abuse and oppression. Rome expanded its territory by killing their enemies, enslaving the weak and exploiting the poor. A pattern which we can still see repeated around the world today. But in contrast, the divine kingdom had a lamb upon the throne. And God's way or rule is with love, grace, and forgiveness. God's territory is expanded by loving your enemies, setting captives free, and bringing good news to the poor. Later in Revelation, the visions go on to show that behind the scenes of the human kingdom, is a battle in the spiritual realm where a beast attacks the lamb and his followers. And eventually the lamb is, uh, sorry, eventually the enemy is overcome and defeated. God's ways are always more powerful than the enemy. He that is in us is greater than he that's in the world.
They will wage war against the Lamb. But the Lamb will triumph over them because he is the true Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Revelation 17, verse 14. The Spirit calls us to follow. Whenever the Spirit speaks, we are called to follow Jesus. In John's vision, God was calling the early church to follow the way of the Lamb. And as subjects of God's kingdom, they were to love each other sacrificially, clothe themselves in acts of righteousness, of good deeds, fight in prayer, <coughs> and stay faithful even unto death. That way, and only that way, would they achieve victory over the enemy. Did the early church do what God said? History tells us of their amazing response. During the early centuries, the church became known for its good deeds. They reached out in generosity to poor, cared for the widows and orphans, tended the sick and gathered the abandoned. In a world where weakness was mocked and the poor were discarded, the actions of Christians stood out, eventually going on to shape the value and values of the Western world. We'd do well to get back to some of them, wouldn't we? The response of the early church to God's voice set out an example for us to follow. I think someone mentioned recently, didn't they, the acronym, what would WWJD? I'm not sure whether it was the guy last week from Open Doors. Someone mentioned that, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, one thing that we can be sure of is that the Holy Spirit would never ask us or tell us to do something that Jesus would not do. Will we do what God says? Follow the way of the Lamb? If we do that way, like them, we will see victory over evil in our lives. And ultimately, the reward of reigning with Him in the new Jerusalem. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Says Revelation 14, 4. How is the Holy Spirit speaking to you about the way of the Lamb this morning? What does it mean for you to have the Lamb on the throne of your life? Let's pray. Lord, help us to follow the only one who is worthy to sit on heaven's throne. Help us to hear your voice calling to us to live according to the ways of God's kingdom and not our own. Help us to hear your voice and to honor you in praise. Amen. Amen.